You can hear me? Okay. Good morning. Well, I choose to give you a little piece of history, history of identity, or more precisely, identities, because we have many, of course. As you know, my subject is titled Modernism and its Continuous Impact on the World in Flux. I hope the simultaneous translation will work. I guess so. So you can follow me, those who speak not, do not speak English. The current phase of the world in transition must be considered a wider context. Modern, modernism makes the elements and factors of change comprehensible since it is the driving force behind them. The apparently solid ground of man's traditional concept of existence is precisely what the Occident has radically questioned. The development of humanity has experienced a quantum leap. Never before has mankind witnessed such advancement. Never before has our collective conscience had to record such abysmal disasters as those perpetrated by man in the 20th century. Where there is light, there is also shadow. Towards the end of the past century, we woke up in a globalized world. It is thus, thanks to the West's most successful export, export item of all times, modernity, including all of its negative implications and positive achievements. The strenuous progress of the European Union raises hopes that it might become a viable model for a post-national, democratic and peaceful future world order. Yet the new world community of risk, which includes the risk factor on man, might ruin these expectations. The prospects are dim indeed. Looking back on the 20th century, the century, the century of wars and conflicts, we are forced to acknowledge the incredible number of an estimated 187 million victims worldwide. Will humanity learn from this experience? Can it change? At the dawn of a new millennium, we time witnesses hesitate between optimism and apprehension, perplexity and confidence. Life in the permanent turmoil of moods and feelings seems to be our destiny. At the beginning of the 21st century, modernity has still a firm grasp on us contemporaries. Some of its essential identity constitutive features and factors are still effective. This analysis therefore concentrates on the facts and ambivalences. It deals with the diversity and reciprocal influences between modernity and society, asking which is their impact on individual and collective identity. Allow me to posit a succinct formula. Identity is complexity is networking. These are indeed interchangeable keywords of the present era. Let us start by analyzing a few of the identity constitutive elements of modernity. History is a multi-layered phenomenon. This is particularly true with regards to modernity. It is furthermore marked by the rise of the masses which Ortega y Gasset has subjected to critical review. 
While in pre-modern times a relatively small number of prominent protagonists had been shaping the cause of history, the French Revolution saw the people appear on the stage of history. This novel fact comprised another one. Epochal change usually unfolds in continuous stages over long periods of time, an incubation time as it were. This was also the case with modernity. The novelty was that this epoch suddenly came of age with a single spectacular thrust. Considering that we have become familiar with disaster, we might imagine the lasting shock, the popular uprising of 1789 and its lethal consequences caused among European peoples. The turn of the tide caught most people unawares. They had to come to terms with the fact that henceforth nothing would be ever the same again. On his way to conquering the, world, conquering the world, Napoleon forcefully reshaped Europe according to rational and secular principles. A certain number of his reforms concerning the modernization of states and societies have proven to be durable. They prepared the soil for the ideas of pre-revolutionary enlightenment particularly the, the relate, uh, those related to the demand for freedom and autonomy to blossom politically and socially, not least through the resistance against the Corsican autocrat. In the spirit of fraternité and égalité, early socialist visions prospered, uh, fooled by former utopias. A new world of self-ruled peoples was to be created. In this respect, I would like to remind you of the Russian social visionary Nikolai Chernyshevsky, the author of one of the important social utopias of the 19th century. It is telling that his book should have been entitled What is to be done? This novel from 1863 advocates the active and concrete reshaping of society by common men and women. Janiszewski's message is that one's own happiness is impossible without the happiness of others. These were the new men who were to create a new and just world. The dream of modernity was cherished by millions of people around the world and still is. For reasons which cannot be discussed here, socialism was unable to assert itself. Or should we add yet? Whatever the outcome, no one seems to be fully enjoy the fact that its antagonist has won the battle, capitalism. One of the sources of the identity of modernity's contemporaries can be found in the most banal yet sought after commodity of daily life, money. Money rules the world. This adage goes back as far as antiquity. Yet it was our modernity which lent its boundless significance. It was modernity which expanded money into the capitalistic system. On the basis of human rights, the droit de l'homme of 1789 and notions of freedom and autonomy, the monetary system eventuated a change in individual and social sensitivity. Since the Middle Ages, the world had appeared to Europeans as a divine creation in which each creature was assigned its own place and task, and people were an integral part of the place where they were born and lived, in full dependency on God's earthly representatives, the nobility and the clergy. This millenary order was disassembled by the revolution, 
as the land was henceforth owned by the people. With the right of personal to personal property and the general right of ownership, post-revolutionary legislation gave the new status a legal duration and binding nature, as in the English Enclosure Act of 1803. The private citizen was now free to buy and sell land which had hitherto been collective property. While this is something we nowadays take for granted, it was in fact the result of a radical upheaval which initiated a groundbreaking change of individual and social identity. In other words, it coincided with the birth of the modern European, the European citizen. For he, too, was a new man. But contrary to Chernyshevsky's characters, he was a thoroughly realistic protagonist. Civil autonomy also, and importantly, meant the freedom to use one's property as one deemed best. Experience teaches us that the longing for privacy and self-determination is just as ingrained in human nature as are the temptations and promises of free market economy. In this respect, the downfall of real existing socialism speaks a clear language. Nevertheless, the development I have just described is an unprecedented, unprecedented process. Following this historical rupture, the world of égalité is divided anew. The new, the new division runs between the unparalleled wealth of an incidental fraction of the world's societies and the despairing poverty of the rest. Poverty seems to be a constant characteristic of mankind. Wealth and the opportunity to gain it, in other terms, money and its system of sheer unlimited multiplication, thus appears, appear to have transformed the world and the planet more profoundly than anything else in history. Money has substantially raised people's living standards uh, in the post-war capitalistic West. Meanwhile, this trend has reached the new middle classes in Eastern Europe and Asia. When noting this, nobody yet realized the present breakdown of the global financial, financial system. We know, however, that the Wall Street crash, as well as the global crash of 1929, are integral part of the capitalist system. The permanent underdogs of history are those masses of people which for lack of means or opportunities have been unable and still are to take part in the market monopoly as competent actors. Their eviction from the land has resulted in the millionfold migration and emigration movements of past centuries, which are now being continued in the shape of global migration for economic and political reasons, as has been consistently the case. In the future, climate change, the key word being water, is likely to prompt new migratory movements. The progressive and necessary change of identity triggered by modernity must increasingly be measured against the will to bridge the gap between the poor and the rich by means of solidarity action. When will the world community be ready for this? Question mark. Modernity has transformed money into a means in itself, a servant ruling over his master. How could the self-determined individual become a slave of money? It appears that the reason for this is to be sought precisely in his autonomy. Our discovery of the ego is owed to autonomy. He who perceives himself as a subject 
is also is able to perceive objects outside of his ego as such. More importantly, he can perceive himself as an object. This means that the ego establishes a distance between itself, others, and objects. This difference, difference, differentiation of the relationship between subject and object is one of the central experiences of modernism to the extent that it determines for the first time and henceforth our relationship to the world. This bears significant con consequences. The increase of space-time distanciation, which historian Anthony Giddens relates to modernity, allows for human interaction based on objectification and rationalization both in the interdependence and the individual individualization are essential prerequisites for the success of the monetary economy and its social function. Exchange. In the pure objectivity of the exchange, objects, and by extension commodities, take on a life of their own, whereas man is of secondary importance only. The sociologist and philosopher Georg Simmel has aptly described this phenomenon. I quote, the relationship between men is replaced by the relationship between objects. Simmel claims that this condition is invested with a near metaphysical quality. Historic change, he writes, results in the, I quote, contemporary dissolution of everything substantial, absolute, eternal, into the flux of things, into merely psychological reality. Who would imagine a definition of the present financial crisis more to the point than this one noted a hundred years ago? The global industry, the, the global industry rids money of its common material value by reducing it to its mere fun functionality in the exchange of goods, thus transforming it into a neutral service provider which it can employ effectively, flexibly, rapidly and over long distances it has globally. Quite obviously, this mere functionality of money has long since been interiorized by the non-committed modern individual. The former ideal of enlightenment, autonomy, has been absorbed by the money monetary system. It has appropriated our life environment and makes people dance to its tune. Its melody spells distance, rhythm, tempo, but its second voice sounds much more dissonant, egotism, greed and social coldness. Yet as I have already pointed out, all endeavors and inventions of the hybrid being man are highly ambivalent. In actual fact, the monetary system has also fostered a cultural progression of fundamental and far-reaching dimensions. The dynamics of free availability of money have enabled the emergence of the private and wealthy individual who may bail himself out of public patronizing. The birth of privacy from within the system uh, in turn spawns the institutions that confine and secure it. I have already mentioned the constitutional right to property. In the consequence and cause of history, the private citizens' independence and social engagement have spurred the establishment of the constitutional state and democracy of parliamentary rule and human rights. We have thus entered the gravitational field of another driving force in the development of modernity, nationalism, and its creation, the nation-state. 
The modern state is causally linked to the monetary system since it primarily served economic purposes and continues to do so. Its task is to stimulate and protect the national economy within its territorial boundaries and ensure its international competitiveness mainly by way of protectionist measures. The state must guarantee the safety of its citizens and their property, among which we must henceforth count their nationality. This is where autonomy again enters our field of vision. Self-determination used to be considered a quality, the attainment, the attainment of which was confined to the individual by virtue of his reason and willpower. Nationalistic zeal, however, transferred the individual gift of enlightenment to the national collectives and by doing so committed a fateful sin. Let me be clear about this. I am referring to the radicalized nationalism of the era of European mass politics. It used the so-called people's right to self-determination as the basis for a bold uh, construction, namely of purportedly homogeneous, yet for the most part forcefully homogenized nations. It served to justify countless ethnically motivated wars as well as ethnic, ethnical cleansing which have been afflicting the world to this very day. The idea of the nation as an eternal bond of individuals sharing a common background and culture is an outdated invention. As early as the 19th century, the time when this concept was in full bloom, the French writer Ernest Renan conceded that there would, could be, I quote, no nation without a falsification of its own history. This conception is nevertheless a telling example of the so-called normative power of the factual. The artifact nation still appears to most as natural, if not God-given. In summary, the monetary system and the nation, quod erat demonstrandum, continue to represent two of the essential factors in the genesis of the individual and collective identity of modernity. Today we live in the interregnum between modernity in crisis and an uncertain future. In retrospect, modernity as a whole appears to us like a historic transition marked by global mutations, a gigantic transforming plant that hoped to catapult a transformed human being from the old rule into a radically new world. The dynamics of change perpetuate themselves. It appears that we cannot easily rid ourselves of the spirits we have summoned. The commonly held opinion is that we, are, that we have entered post-modernity. As a matter of fact, modernity, having entered a phase of radicalization, is in crisis. The current situation of the world could therefore be, be, ter be termed a twilight zone. It will, also, it will no doubt bear significant consequences on the condition of our identities. We are the creations and heirs of the modern age. Our task is to salvage the positive aspects of this difficult heritage into an, into an uncertain future and to overcome its evil legacies. In this respect, we are facing a series of imminent threats and risks. The first of which is the ecological time bomb. Reckless progress and unrefrained growth have brought the world on the brink of destruction. This understanding seems, seems to slowly make its way into the collective conscience and to become part of a common identity that transcends, transcends all boundaries. 
the dissolution of boundaries for the first time in history conveys to us a concrete concept of mankind and a sense of belonging. Evil could thus be turned into good. This applies also to one of the much defamed threats of this time of transition, globalization. It is true that globalization is the legit legitimate offspring of capitalism. Private entrepreneurship and free trade, international trade relations and free floating capital, in short, the modern monetary system and its dynamic cross-border development from a national to a global economy, these are the factors that first opened the gate to the world. Their former advocate, the nation state, is the loser of history. From their inception, private economy and the financial market have eluded state control. The rise of the economy as the undisputed number one factor in the gamble for political power was merely a question of time. As still a still uncontrolled automatism, it is fast becoming the dominant agent in national and global life environments. Will it succeed to correct this fatal mistake? Question mark. It is exactly this problem the international community is presently trying to solve. Politics may be on the winning side again. The global expansion of modernity's institutions could, would be impossible without the ubiquitous availability of relevant information in real time thanks to modern communication technology which has long since taken hold of the world. New media and the Internet make news from around the world available and accessible to the common folk. For many, knowledge, a key notion of enlightenment, is becoming a driving force of modernization and a breeding ground of democracy. And although it contributes to the disenchanting of the world, the advantages of global networking prevail as it has strangers become neighbors. This new stage in our cultural evolution is the focus of this analysis. Following in the wake of monetary flows, globalization becomes the architect of a single world, itself another risk zone. Ambivalence is present again. Many before have cherished the dream of a single world. Immanuel Kant, Friedrich Schiller, and not least German national economists have expected the advent of, future, of a future world community. The continuous expansion of social development from smaller to larger entities, from local to regional and national alliances is a historic fact which makes the subsequent step towards a society of world citizens seem plausible, provided that it is not altogether foolish to make out some sense and logic in human endeavors. A progress toward sub- and supranational structures may indeed be observed. In the first place, let me point out to the advance against all odds of the European Union. There is, furthermore, the growth and consolidation of regional movements and the growing influence of supranational and independent organizations or NGOs, not least civil initiatives and structures, the numbers and activities of which are globally on the rise. It thus appears that the vision of a cosmopolitan world order has for quite some time been cause for cautious hopes and projections. To put it succinctly, hope is scarce. In the current twilight zone that characterizes the world, the gap between desire and reality is widening. 
One of the main obstacles to the development is the, I quote, simultaneousness of the non-simultaneous, as Ernst Bloch has termed the parallel and conflict-prone existence of global cultures, philosophies, and ethics in different stages of their development. The fundamental question is whether Homo sapiens globaliensis will not only be ready but also able to surpass himself and create a new world order. But who are we actually dealing with? The, to answer this question we shall turn our attention away from the global picture and to the detail by considering the nature of individual identity. To this effect, we are provided a tool of analysis by a branch of science that, which has only recently taken center stage, neurobiology. Over the past years, brain research has been making astonishing discoveries in trying to decipher human identity. More importantly, it has slaughtered a few holy cows by considering man as a product of evolution without ifs and buts. Homo sapiens is acknowledged as a hybrid being having emerged from biological and cultural evolution. From prehistoric times on, our development is determined by a large array of innate characteristics. Early childhood, childhood experiences play a role as well, though to a lesser extent. Last but not least, our cultural background is shaped in adolescence and is largely influenced by our parents and schools. From the perspective of, a, of brain research, conscience is a network of extremely complex neuronal processes over which we have little influence, over which we exert little influence, sorry. The notion of being man, of being God's image is therefore just as unfounded as is the recurring for this philosophical concept of free will. Free will, scientists agree, is not merely a fiction. More to the point, this cultural construct is the result of our consciousness' boundless pretense. Conscience, according to science, is only partly guided by reason. Contrary to Descartes' assessment, whose influence has prevailed for centuries, body and mind cannot be separated. Rather, this emotionally steered unity of body and mind, which we share with other animals, is mainly determined by our prelingual unconscious heritage. The notion of man's autonomy, self-determination and rationality is a fragile construction if we are to believe neurobiology. This questions some of the central founding principles of modernity. But even if they are fictions, if they are, they are fictions, there remains something like the subjective impression to be free. And there is no doubt that uh, the sense of self exists. Yet the idea of an individual self does not stand the test of, obje of obje objective scientif scientific analysis. Science demonstrates that we are bestowed with several conditions of the self, that is to say, with several identities or a complex identity. In this regard, the multiple social characteristics of modern man are already ingrained in the cerebral functions that constitute our conscience. Indeed, instead, oh sorry, instead of individuals, we are individuals divided and not undivided personalities. In this, line, in this insight, is this insight not a favorable, favorable promise, a premise, if we intend to come to terms with an increasingly complex reality? 
come to end. The neuronal, the neuronal scientist's thesis were met with harsh resistance. Yet what matters is to interpret them as a hopeful message. Neurobiology is not just a school of complexity, but also one of modesty. Is it, not, it is not merely age-old anthropocentrism which is called into question here. It is difficult not to notice the recent decrees of the typically modern delusion of omnipotence, arrogance, and macho culture. It would seem that humanity is about to learn that unfettered exploitation of nature, constant growth, and blind progress cannot but harm it in the long term. The neuroscientist's message is reassuring to the extent that the human brain, notwithstanding evolutionary determination, is easily influenced, provided the teaching process starts early. That through learning and experience, the brain is able to achieve new levels of performance. Feelings, too, can be learned. The challenges, the challenges society faces in the wake of the current social, political, and moral crisis of the world might therefore induce us to take the necessary steps to adapt to the changing conditions and find serviceable solutions. The neuroscientist Wolf Singer is convinced that we can and should learn from nature. He writes, I quote, similarly to the way, considering how our brains function, that we had to dismiss structural models based on hierarchies, as we realize that the nature works not in hierarchies, but in networks, we shall see that it is impossible to manage complex societies from top down. Thank you.